So hi everyone, I'm here with Lila Carell, a graduate of my course on the music of the 60s, evolution of the revolution, and you're going to run me through uh, my introductory, introductory lecture. Are you not? I am. Okay. Okay. Ask away. Ask. All right. So I, why is the course called the evolution of the revolution? Okay. Um, there's no such thing as a, one course on the music of the 60s. There could be a zillion courses, right? There's courses on the Beatles and there's courses on the British Invasion and uh, there were so many genres in the 60s. So what I've chosen to do is to focus on the songs, the music, uh, the background that was evolutionary and revolutionary, both from the point of view of the music and also the, the background, the goings-on, the philosophy. Um, and at the end of the course we ask two questions. First of all, was there really a um, musical revolution in the 60s? And I think the answer is yes, a resounding yes. And uh, was there also a revolution uh, in the mantras of the 60s? Is anything left from, from Woodstock? That's a more difficult question, but we also talk about that through the, uh, through the course. Okay. Why do you say that the 60s revolution started in 63? Okay, well, you have to start somewhere. I mean, you know, January 1st, 1960 is just a day. Uh, I really think that the evolution of the revolution started at the end of 63, beginning of 1964. Three things happened. First of all, a John Kennedy was murdered towards the end of November. Uh, the assassination of Kennedy uh, changed the world, it changed the music, it changed the ethics, it, it really brought on the 60s revolution, I believe. Um, also, uh, at the end of nineteen, at the end of November, nineteen sixty-three, Bob Dylan sits down to write the um, the national anthem of the protest movement, if you will. Uh, the times they are changing, uh, and in nineteen sixty-three, the Beatles are beginning to build momentum in Britain, and they will proceed to conquer America starting in February of nineteen sixty-four. So I think that these three events conspire to. These are the icebergs that, that meet and uh, bump into each other. Kennedy's assassination, Dylan and the Beatles bring on the 60s. The right circumstances. Uh, the, well, circumstances, happenstances, whatever the case may be. Okay. Why is Woody <coughs> Guthrie important here? He okay. wasn't a 60s singer. That's right. Woody Guthrie was very ill uh, th throughout most of the 50s and 60s. He died in 1967. I think it was... 51 or 52 years old. Uh, but Woody Guthrie was a, a, a persona who, um, who personified the protest, the folk movement, if you will, um, especially in the 30s and 40s. And Bob Dylan, Robert Zimmerman, if you will, who called himself after the famous poet at that time, uh, Dylan Thomas. <coughs> in my class, when I ask students who remembers Dylan Thomas, there's only one in a hundred and they don't even remember who he was. Well, Dylan Thomas was a famous poet, <laughs> and um, the reason we remember him, funnily enough, is because Bob Dylan changed his name. I mean, how ironic is that? Uh, Bob Dylan was one of the icebergs of the 60s, and uh, he was a, um, a kind of an intellectual groupie of Woody Guthrie. He spent a lot of time with him, uh, and um, his early music certainly was, was inspired by, by Woody Guthrie. Uh, the other reason <coughs> is uh, because Woody Guthrie wrote one of the national anthems, if you will, of, um, of America. Not the protest movement, America. Uh, the song, This Land is Your Land. This land is your land, this land is my land. Uh, this is a Woody Guthrie song. Um, and we teach it in class because there's a huge irony here. Uh, the song seems very innocuous at the beginning. Uh, this land is made for you and me. Um, and Americans all know this in the first two stanzas. But if you go down and you scroll down to the fourth stanza, um, you find some questionable, perhaps anti-American, anti-capitalism, uh, socialist uh, stanzas there. Uh, the fourth verse... He talks about walking down a road, and uh, on the right there was an anti-trespassing sign, and on the other side there was no trespassing sign. That side of the road was made for you and me. And then in the fifth stanza, if I'm not mistaken, he talks about um, in the city uh, he sees his people standing in the relief line. So this is the 30s, the Depression. 
Uh, and then he asked himself, is this land made for you and me? So I don't think you can start the course without Woody Guthrie, uh, a real protest singer, uh, and um, the, um, the father, if you will, the, um, the musical father of, uh, Woody G of uh, Bob Dylan. Okay. In your lecture, you talk about a song by the Young Bloods. Tell me about that. Um, well, there was, there was a mantra in the 60s. The 60s music and um, the belief of the young people was that uh, we, can, we can change the world with the music. Um, on, on Woody Guthrie's, they didn't start that. On Woody Guthrie's guitar, there was a, a sign that says, this instrument kills fascists. Uh, um, Tom Lehrer, whom I try to teach in the course at a later stage, uh, once uh, talked about the, uh, the civil war against uh, Franco in the 1930s in Spain. And he says, well, how could we have lost the war when we had all the good songs? So uh, Moody Guthrie had on his guitar, this machine kills fascists, uh, with the belief that music uh, could change the world. Um, the Young Bloods actually, they didn't write that song, it was a cover. We talk a lot in the course about covers because sometimes the covers become more famous than the originals. For example, uh, a lot of my students think that, think that Lelania was written by um, Deep Purple when it was actually written by Donovan. Um, and how would you feel if you wrote a famous cover uh, and you were the original but nobody remembers your version of it? Would you be happy? Would you be sad? If you got a million dollars in royalties, would you be a happy camper or would you still want people to say Lilac wrote that song? Yeah. We talk about that mm -hmm. in class and the students come up with interesting answers. So at any rate, uh, the Youngbloods had this song in the, I think about 67, uh, people smile on your brother, everybody get together, try to love one another right now. A year or two later we have in here, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, harmony and understanding. Um, and this topic comes up again and again in the 1960s um, in the singing and in the free spirit of, let's say, the, the hippie movement, the Woodstock Nation and so on. Um, well, did it last? Is there something left of that spirit to the present day? So yes, of course, we have a look at the Youngblood song. Uh, we talk about uh, Hair and uh, the other songs that talked about a better world, a, a world of integrity, of peace, of brotherhood, and so on. Yes. Why do you mention Pete Yarrow? Peter Yarrow, <laughs> for several reasons. First of all, Peter Yarrow was, of course, the, um, the founding triangle of Peter, Paul, and Mary. He's uh, Peter, uh, a, a trio that was put together by Albert Grossman. Uh, in the very early 60s, uh, really good singers with amazing uh, vocal harmonies in Greenwich Village. And because Albert Grossman also, uh, he uh, produced the, uh, Bob Dylan, so uh, Peter, Paul and Mary with their wonderful singing actually made Bob Dylan famous, right? The cover of, uh, of Blowing in the Wind, uh, the, perhaps the original is, is, is uh, Peter, Paul and Mary. Uh, Peter went on to have an amazing career, also as a spokesman for education. He talks about the importance of having integrity, of being a man. She's Jewish, so he even talks about being a man. So we quote him in the course, and I'm now trying to establish content with him, contact with him, so that he can send us a, a message, like a blast from the present on the 60s, and whether uh, he thinks that the world is a better place because of the music that they were so good at bringing on in those years. That's nice. Um, how does Judy Collins figure into your introduction? Well, again, Judy Collins uh, is a very famous uh, singer from the 60s, very talented musician, beautiful, um, and she was able to pick the best artists and make them famous, uh, Leonard Cohen, uh, Tom Paxton, Gordon Lightfoot, Joni Mitchell, and many others. And uh, I actually found her on Facebook, um, which is arguably perhaps a kind of a 60s uh, social uh, engagement tool here in the, uh, in the new era. And she actually wrote a letter to my class, which I, which I read every class, and she writes, among other things, um, to think about your past in the following terms. She says, look back, but don't stare, which I think is, is awesome. So Judy's uh, spirit is part of our course. That's very interesting. 
Um, what about John Baez and Donovan? Why are they important? Well, John Baez is another figure in Greenwich Village in the early 60s, a uh, very important protest singer. And uh, in 1960, um, they produced her first album. And essentially what they did is they rented a hall in a hotel in New York, at least this is the narrative, and uh, Joan sits down and uh, two microphones, uh, because in those days they, they, um, the stereo had come out and they, they would do two tracks, right? So in her case, singing and, and guitar, and they said, okay, Joan, now just play all the songs from your performance. And that's what she did. And out came a really remarkable, album uh, because it was it was so authentic. Well, authenticity is so important in life and in the course. And in that record, there's a song called Donna Donna. And Donna Donna is a song that was written originally in Yiddish uh, in the 1940s. Most people don't know that. So of course I talk about that. And, and the funny thing is um, we talked a little bit about Donovan earlier. In Donovan's album in 1965, I think his debut album also, he also sings Donna Donna. So it's interesting to compare these, these covers and the irony of the fact that such songs, nobody knows that they were originally uh, songs in Yiddish, um, and this song in particular perhaps written uh, about the Holocaust, about persecution, uh, calves uh, looking up to the sky and, and seeing the birds flying free while they're on their way to be to be slaughtered helplessly. All right. Um, you end your introduction with the sound of silence and hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, can you explain why? Yes, um, because we talked about uh, the icebergs meeting, right? So there is a collision of the folk movement. So we've spoken about folk artists, um, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Joan Baez, and, and, and the, the young Dylan, uh, and the young Donovan, and these are more folksy uh, singers with a guitar, you know, and... Uh, and and uh, in 1964, they run into the other iceberg, which is the success of the Beatles. The Beatles are a rock band, okay, an early rock band, uh, with huge success in, in Britain in 1963, poised to conquer the world in 1964 with the rock beat, which is one, one, two, three, four. It's a double back beat, or a regular is one, two. Um, Herman's Hermits, I'm Henry the Waith, I am. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So this beat, the rock beat, started conquering the radio charts and the, and the, and the television. And if you didn't have that beat in 1964-65, you lost market share to all the people who had started listening to the Beatles and then fallen in love with this rock music. And several things happened that I think are very poignant and important for the course. In 1964, Simon and Garfunkel uh, released their first uh, album, their first real LP on Capitol, and I think, um, Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., which is a kind of a hodgepodge of, of folk and gospel songs and a few songs that Paul Simon has written. Uh, and at the end of the record, there's a song called Sound of Silence. Um, the record doesn't go anywhere. It's 1964. People want to hear Beatles. Uh, Paul Simon goes off to Europe. Um, and um, in the meantime, uh, another thing happens, and that is that a... Bob Dylan writes another one of his wonderful songs, Mr. Tambourine Man, uh, and uh, there's two recordings from early 1965. One of the recordings, the, the acoustic recording, um, you know, uh, Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, Dylan. A very authentic and wonderful piece of music produced by Tom Wilson, uh, and uh, it's acoustic. and. About the same time, his friends, the birds, record a jingle jangle version with the rock beat. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, with the Rickenbacker 12 string and the tambourines. And that is the version that makes it big. Um, so Tom Wilson, either at this, who was produced the acoustic version, either at this time or even earlier, he realizes that the folk movement is losing ground to the rock beat. So he has this idea. 
And he goes back into the studio and he takes the acoustic version of Sounds of Silence. Without asking Simon or Garfunkel, he hires a electric guitar and a bass and drums. And they keep the first stanza of the song the way it is. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Very quiet. And then at the end of the first stanza, bang! In rest is dreams I walk alone. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Right? Uh, the first version, the acoustic version, goes nowhere. The second goes to the top of the charts. And Paul Simon, according to the narrative, is somewhere in Europe, in, I think in 1965, and somebody tells him, you know, you have a hit song on the hit parade. He said, no, that's impossible. He says, no, Paul, Sounds of Silence has like, gone off the charts. I'm not even sure he knew what had happened. And they've taken this acoustic version, which is much, which has a lot more integrity and it's closer to the meaning of the song, like Hey Mr. Tambourine Man, right? And uh, they've turned it into a, a rock song, okay? Well, maybe you're a youngster now with all the metal and the, uh, and the uh, new music, you'll say that's very, you know, it's barely a rock song, right? There's no distortion or whatever. But for people in 1965 who weren't used to this kind of music, this was revolutionary. And these are the two versions of the song that went big. The, the, the versions where the icebergs collided, where folk came together with rock. In 1965, Bob Dylan goes to the Newport Festival and plays electronic music with an electric guitar, loses half of his customers, mm -hmm. but gains a kind of uh, eternal uh, celebration for his new kind of music. Um, so I think that that's... That's where we end the first lecture in this meeting of the two icebergs. Thank you. <laughs>